Good evening, everybody. It is the first Wednesday of the month, and you know what that means. It means that we are going to have a new Project Due Diligence engineer on our continuing webinars. Each month, we're bringing you the World Trade Center 7 evidence first, and then the uh, Twin Towers, all the evidence of uh, explosive demolition there. Uh, we've been doing this for a few months now, and they seem to be pretty popular. And because it's the month of September, we have, of course, our CEO here, Roland Engel. Uh, Roland is, of course, like I just said, the CEO of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. He graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. As well, he served in the U.S. Army Special Forces, where he was trained in the use of explosives. His 50 years of experience as a civil engineer has included designing and testing of blast-hardened missile launch facilities, along with designing U.S. Naval Explosive Containers, harbor terminal facilities, earth foundation systems, and hydraulic systems. In addition, Roland has owned three construction companies and has taught engineering subjects to high school students, just like he's going to be doing tonight. Now, if you're an engineer and want to get credit for viewing this presentation, all you have to do is simply write to us at uh, cpd at ae911truth.org. Again, that's cpd at ae911truth.org and uh, simply request your credit. You gotta include your name, confirm that you're an engineer, and also in the email, you have to tell us what's your biggest takeaway from this presentation. What was that? What was that? Uh, so outline that, and that's it. We will uh, be awarding you your credit from there. So with all of that out of the way, I'm gonna disappear, hand the floor over to Roland. Roland, take it away. Thank you, Andy. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever on the globe you're coming from today. Our webinar today is the subject of World Trade Center Building 7 and the collapse that occurred on September 11th, 2001. It was the third high-rise skyscraper that collapsed that day, and it did so late in the afternoon after suffering some minor structural damage caused by the collapse of one of the Twin Towers and then enduring some office fires for several hours. We're going to examine the process of what happened to the building that day and then look closely at the government report that explained that process and gave us an analysis of why they think the building collapsed. Our presentation is entitled Critical Decisions That Detailed That Derailed the World Trade Center Investigation. As you can tell from our title, we do not believe the official government report on this catastrophic failure has accurately explained why the collapse occurred. We're going to look at the events of the day that relate to the damage the building suffered, <clears throat> and then we're going to look at the investigation conducted by the authorities and the decisions they made that enabled them to come to the conclusion that the building failed due to normal office fires. The report issued by the government was issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, and uh, they are a branch of the Commerce Department. They issued this report on the collapse of the building in November of 2008, some seven years after it happened, and six years after Congress had passed the National uh, Construction Safety Team Act, which gave them the power to conduct the investigation. World Trade Center 7 was the third high rise that collapsed that day. It was about 350 feet from the North Tower and it collapsed later that day from a 610 foot tall, 47 story steel frame building, not hit by a plane into a pile of rubble about five stories high in about seven seconds. Now we're gonna look at what that happened, the way that happened that day from the vantage of several different videos. For the third time today, reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before, the building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. Did they actually use the word lockdown? And who was that was telling you this? The fire department. The fire department. And um, they did use the word we're gonna have to bring it, we're gonna have to bring it down. We have this sound we found like a cloud of thunder. It looked like there was a shock wave uh whipping through the building and the windows all uh busted out. About a second later the bomb pulled the caves out. The building followed after that and uh, we saw the building collapse down all the way to the ground. And I turned to the side to see uh, what looked like uh, a skyscraper explosion. It looked like 
Now, as you could tell from the audio that accompanied those videos, many, if not most of the people that watched the building come down, thought that it looked like a controlled demolition. People are familiar with these, having seen hotels in Las Vegas routinely brought down by this method. So that was the general perception that day. However, the NIST conclusion was that the building came down due to normal office fires. So we're going to look at the 16 decisions that occurred that day and subsequently that we think derailed the investigation away from the most obvious cause of why the building collapsed and coming up with a conclusion that was a unique in history. Never before had a fire, let alone normal office fires, brought down a steel frame high rise building. So those decisions are in chronological order, the decision not to fight the fires that day in the building, to destroy most of the physical evidence, to appoint NIST to conduct the investigation, not to test for incendiaries, to ignore the presence of molten metal in the debris, to ignore high temperature damage to the steel, to ignore evidence of explosions in the building, to exaggerate the fire thermal load on the structure, to falsify the thermal load effect on the structure, to omit critical structural features, to fabricate the cascade of floor failures, to fabricate the buckling of column 79, to fabricate the collapse of the other core columns, to fabricate the model collapse of the building, to ignore the significance of free fall, and not to respond to legitimate engineering inquiries. We can look at those one by one. First decision to cease firefighting efforts in World Trade Center 7. These two comments come from the NIST report itself. The first says, had a water supply for the automatic sprinkler system been available and had the sprinkler system operated as designed, it's likely the fires in the building would have been controlled and the collapse prevented. They go on to say, as early as 1130, the fire department found there was no water supplied by the hydrant system to fight the fires. With the collapse of the towers fresh, there was concern the building might collapse, risking the life of additional firefighters. Within the next two hours, serious discussions were underway regarding the cessation of any efforts to save the building, and the final order to cease was given about 2.30 p.m. So according to NIST, there was no water available to fight the fires. The firefighters were afraid that the building was going to collapse. And so they decided not to fight the fires. This is a statement from Hughes Associate, which was one of the contractors that NIST hired to study the uh, fire aspects of the buildings. And they come to a completely different conclusion. They say the hydraulic calculations shows that in spite of large flows of broken to broken street mains at Liberty and West Streets, municipal water distribution system was able to maintain pressure along Liberty Street and Church Street at more than 19 PSI. And they, they have this table over here that shows various locations of hydrants and the water pressure that was available. So we see at these three hydrants on Liberty Street, there was water pressure available in excess of 19 PSI, and uh, it was never tapped. Similarly, down here on Church Street, uh, this is the hydrant at BC and Church Street, which was right literally next to World Trade Center 7. There was plenty of water pressure available. It was never opened and never used. There was no flow. There was flow available, but they did not use it. So the uh, NIST report which claims that there was no water available to fight fires was simply not true. In addition, the NIST report goes on to say by about noon, a, a fire department fire boat and another one, a retired fire boat, were operating on the shoreline on the Hudson, Hudson River near the site. 
and they were stretching hose lines up to the World Trade Center site. According to the fire department first person interviews, water was never an issue at World Trade Center 7 since firefighting was never started in the building. So it isn't true that there was no water available to fight the fires. There was a decision made and the decision made was by the firefighting uh, crews at the time, but they were giving advice from the uh, operation, uh, the uh, emergency operations center uh, from uh, the mayor's office. And they were being told that the building was ready to collapse. And that's the reason why they didn't go in. NIST never identifies uh, that information or says where it came from. The second critical decision was the decision to destroy the evidence. Very little effort was made to preserve the evidence. Now we're going to hear from a, a couple of engineers uh, that were uh, with the building performance assessment team, which FEMA organized with the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers uh, right after the buildings collapsed. When did you become aware that the steel from the World Trade Center was being sold off? Uh, I think it was uh, under an order of a week or so before we arrived on site on uh, October the uh, 5th, I believe. So they were, they, in other words, the city was selling uh, or was disposing of a material within two weeks of the actual event? I believe I was the first one to, to find out that the steel is being recycled. The New York Times reporter Jim Glass told me two weeks after labs and and i tried to uh, contact city and and also the attack reporters try to make sure we, we can have access to steel to do the research it was not happening i just think there's so much that that has been lost in these last six months uh that we can never go back and retrieve and that's it's only unfortunate it's borderline criminal 400 truckloads per day of material were taken away from the World Trade Center site and sent to China for recycling. There were laws violated in the destruction of that evidence. And for the American Society of Civil Engineers to ignore those events is extremely disturbing and is a violation, in my opinion, of their professional code of ethics. It was contrary to the way all investigations are done. If, if an airplane crashes, they seal off the entire area and nobody touches anything. They move it to a secure location and they reconstruct an aircraft. Normally, uh, when you have a structural failure, uh, you carefully go through the debris field, uh, looking at each item, photographing every beam as it collapsed and every uh, uh, column where it is in the ground, and you pick them up very carefully and you uh, look at each element. We were unable to do that in the case of Tower 7. You can't do science when you are deprived of the evidence and when your hypothesis is the least valid instead of the most likely. When the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned, uh, this is not science. It's trying to prove preconceived ideas. <sighs> Here's a couple of statements uh, regarding the cleanup uh, by a couple of observers. Uh, this one says that the New York City Department of Design and Construction took control of the site as a result of Mayor Giuliani's backroom decision to scrap the city's organization charts and to allow the DDC to proceed. The DDC Deputy Commissioner, Michael Burton, who had become the effective czar with a cleanup job, had made it clear that he cared very little about engineering subtleties like the question of why the towers first stood, then collapsed on September 11th. We know why they fell, he said, because they flew two planes into the towers. But he was deeply immersed in the details of hauling steel out of the debris pile. So we see that the mayor's office and the uh, New York City Department of Design and Construction were in control of deciding to remove most of the wreckage as quickly as possible. The third decision was to appoint NIST to conduct the investigation. Under pressure from family members, Congress passed the National Construction Team Safety Act 
on October 1st, 2002, the act empowered the director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology to establish uh, procedures regarding conflicts of interest related to the service on the team and guiding the teams in moving and preserving evidence. To the maximum extent possible, preserve evidence relating to the building failures, especially if federal law enforcement suspects and notifies the director that a building failure uh, has been caused by a criminal act. Uh, the team in consultation with the federal law enforcement agency shall take necessary actions to ensure that the evidence of the criminal act is preserved. So what happened in the case of uh, this building was since the uh, national uh, act was not passed into law until more than a year after the attack, the preservation of the evidence provisions were moot because the site had been essentially scrubbed and most of the evidence discarded by that time. However, the conflicts of interest provision were meaningless as defined by the act itself because NIST is an agency of the Department of Commerce, a department of the executive branch of the federal government. And since the executive branch of the federal government had failed in its duty to prevent the attack, it was a party of interest to the events and hence never should have been given the power to conduct the investigation. Instead, Congress should have created a special independent agency like the National Transportation Safety Board to conduct the investigation so as to make a meaningful attempt to avoid potential conflicts of interest. So the director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology at that time should have refused to do the job because there was an inherent conflict of interest in this taking on the task. The next decision was not to test for incendiaries. So we're going to hear some uh, uh, testimony as regard what happened in that regard. Proper investigation performed that might have revealed the use of accelerants or explosives in World Trade Center 7's destruction. NIST concedes that they found no evidence for explosives. So then we asked them, well, did you look? And they said, no, we did not look for explosives or residues of explosives. Just the fact that there were explosions means they need to be investigated. Terrorists used explosives in the 93. We have witnesses to explosions. We have audio recording of explosions. We have overwhelming evidence that there were some explosive events. The manual gets into thermite, and it says if you have melted steel or concrete, which we had on 9-11, and there's videos of it, people can see it, we should test for it. It says when you have melted steel or concrete, you test for thermite. So the fact that they're not testing for it is, is crazy. <laughs> We had 3,000, you know, Americans murdered, and we had the first three high-rise and steel collapses. We have all these reports of explosions. We have the history of terrorists using explosives. It's absolutely ridiculous that, they, I mean, there's no excuse for it. It's criminal, in my opinion. The national standards are very clear. We have preservation of evidence. We have spoilation of evidence. There's all kinds of and basically standards that you don't destroy evidence. We don't have a real story on what happened because there wasn't a proper investigation done. The fifth decision was to ignore molten metal in the debris. This is a photo taken by the uh, uh, geological survey five days after the event. And it, infrared shows that the temperatures in the basement of all three of the buildings exceeded uh, 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is well beyond the temperatures that you could expect from office fires or jet fuel. However, neither NIST nor the FEMA report nor the 9-11 Commission had any mention of the large quantities of molten metal that were observed in the basements of all three buildings as a result of those temperatures. The sixth decision was to ignore high temperature steel damage. This is a uh, photo of a piece of steel that came from building seven. We know the A36 steel was only used in building, since building seven. And we can see looking at the uh, steel that there are large holes eroded in it. 
uh, and it's been thinned out uh, to uh, razor sharp edges. So this has been attacked by some sort of an incendiary. Uh, office fires and jet fuel can't do this. So uh, that was uh, included actually in the NIST report. This was from the uh, Appendix C of the FEMA report. However, NIST ignored it, didn't pay any attention to it. We know they were available and they had uh, uh, access to it because this is a picture of John Gross, one of their principal investigators. And he's actually got his hand on a piece of this steel uh, in the yard. And they only saved uh, uh, about 236 pieces from both the Twin Towers and only one small piece from Building 7. And then uh, when they were asked about the lack of uh, high temperature evidence, they said, well, their sample was too small to draw conclusions, but they were in control of pulling the sample. The seventh decision was the decision to ignore evidence of explosions in World Trade Center 7. Now, these first two interviews are from city employees, uh, uh, Mr. Jennings and Mr. Weiss, that were uh, inadvertently went to Building 7 that morning uh, because that was where they were supposed to go uh, to report to the Office of Emergency Management. And they didn't realize the building had already been evacuated. But they were caught there, and they described what they witnessed. Well, me and Mr. Hess, the Corporation Council, were on the 21st floor. I told them we got to get get out of here. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Flew us back into the eighth floor. And I turned to Hess. I said, this is it. We're dead. We're not going to make it out of here. And then we have Mr. Uh, Hess's uh, explanation. Yes, I was. I was up in the emergency management center on the 23rd floor, and when all the power went out in the building, uh, another gentleman and I walked down to the 8th floor where there was an explosion, and we'd been trapped on the 8th floor with smoke, thick smoke, all around us for about an hour and a half. Now, that occurred before uh, the first tower uh, collapsed at 9 o'clock, and uh, the second, uh, the sec uh, uh, excuse me, at 10 o'clock, and the second tower didn't explode, didn't collapse until 1030. They were trapped in the building seven during that entire time. Now, this next testimony is from Richard Rotans, who was the uh, deputy commissioner at the operate at the Office of Emergency Management. And he went into the building uh, later that day uh, and he describes what he saw at that time. Building to assess it. You can hear the building creak above us. You can hear things fall. You can hear the fire burning. You can see columns just hanging from the floors, gaping holes in the floors up above us. There was an elevated car that was blown out of the shaft and it was down the hall. This is, you know, the, the massive impact from the fall of Tower 1 onto Tower 7. Now, Mr. Rotans ascribes that damage to the uh, fall of the North Tower which happened at 10.30 that morning. However, there's no evidence that the debris from that tower, which was very light by the time it reached 350 feet to uh, Building 7, could have had the kind of power that was needed to cause the kind of destruction that he describes there. That is broken interior core columns, elevator blown, blown out of its shaft. This is, this is from the... Uh, we believe, from the earlier explosions that was described by Mr. Jennings and Mr. Hess. The eighth decision was to examine, exaggerate the, ther the thermal load. Now, the thermal load caused by the fire on the building, uh, according to NIST, uh, traveled. Uh, let's look at the building itself first. Here's the uh, perimeter columns. There's 58 columns, 24 columns in the interior the blue lines represent beams that uh, uh, connect the uh, perimeter to the core, and the black lines represent girders that the beams tie into. And according to NIST, what caused the building to fail, fail was fires in, in the northeast corner of the building on the 12th and 13th floor heated these beams here in the northeast corner. They expanded and pushed this girder off of its seat at column 79. That girder fell down, 
caused a cascade of four failures in this corner of the building, all the way down to the fifth floor. Then this column was overloaded and buckled, caused these uh, cup, these uh, columns adjacent to it to buckle, which then caused a progression of column failures from east to west, all the way across the center of the building. And that caused the perimeter columns to buckle and the building to come down in the manner it was observed. So that's the NIST explanation for what happened. So let's look at that a little closer. Here's a picture of the building taken from the north. And this building is documented to have been taken around 350, which is an hour and a half before the building came down. We're concerned with the 12th and 13th floor because that's where the uh, collapse initiated, according to NIST. So we see an hour and half before the building came down that the fires on the 12th floor were working their way from the east to the west, and they were all the way down here, almost at the west end of the building. The fires on the 13th floor were at about column 44, column, column 45 at that time, and they were also working their way westward. So keep that in mind. Now let's look at what NIST said about the fires. This is their uh, computer model. And this is the 12th floor, the concrete floor and the uh, structural steel underneath it. This is the 13th floor, the concrete floor and the structural steel underneath it. And according to them, this is what it looked like at 5 p.m. Okay, 5 p.m. is only 20 minutes before the building collapsed. So according to them, at 5 p.m., the fire on the 13th and the 12th floor was most intense on the east side of the building. And uh, that's where the temperatures were the highest, as we can see by the red color coding. So they're saying that the temperatures at that time were about 675 degree, or 575 degrees uh, right in the north at the northeast, the east and the northeast corner of the building. But let's go back now and look at what the actual fires were like. This is an hour and a half before that. The fires on the 12th floor had already worked their way down. They were down all the way down the other end of the building. And the 13th floor, if this thing is traveling about 75 or 100 feet an hour, the flyers on the 13th floor would also have been down at the west end of the building. So this depiction by NIST for their computer model to uh, simulate the thermal load is not accurate, doesn't uh, comply with what the physical evidence showed us in, in the photos. So that is a, 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 um, an anomaly that has to be addressed. The next decision was to falsify the structural thermal effect. This is a model of the 12th and the 13th floor taken from the University of Alaska Fairbanks study that we paid for. And uh, uh, Professor Halsey and his team up there studied this uh, building collapse for four years. And they used uh, computer models, two of them, to uh, examine what happened when you heated the uh, structure. And so here we see the perimeter columns, the core columns. This is the northeast corner up here. This is column 79. And uh, he was interested in what happened when you heated that with the thermal load that uh, NIST used. And he used the same load that NIST used. He didn't want to argue with that. He just wanted to see how the structure behaved under the same conditions. So this is his model. Uh, and it shows that uh, the center of movement, no movement, see this zero movement here, this color indicates where there was zero movement. Because when you heat this whole floor, it's going to expand away from the center of thermal load. And everything is going to move away from that. So we see that down here, for instance, in the southwest corner, this moved uh, some three, three and a half inches away from the center. And over here on the east side, this uh, moved about five and a half inches or so away from the center. So everything expanded outward from the center of the floor. However, this claimed that this wall uh, along the east side of the building was rigid and all of the thermal expansion would have gone to the west if that was true. Well, that's what they needed to get a maximum movement of the uh, girder 
away from its seat at column 79. So the uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks, following the laws of physics, says that when you heat something, it's going to expand away from a center of uh, mass. And that's not what NIST claimed. So they, we have uh, a, a falsification, really, of the laws of physics there. The next decision was to omit critical structural features. And NIST claimed, uh, first of all, that there was no shear studs on girder, uh, the girder between 79 and 44. And that was, of course, used to tie the concrete floor to the steel frame structure and make it act as a unit. Uh, NIST left those off because, of course, in their model, they want this whole structure here to fall down. And if it was tied to the concrete floor, that would have been more difficult. They also left some stiffeners off the end of the girder where it connected to column 79. This is their model. And we're looking here at the end of the girder. And here's the column. Here it is from above. But in actuality, the uh, structural drawing showed that there were stiffeners welded to the uh, web of, of the girder and the lower flange. We can see them over here. And they were welded all the way around. And that stiffens the lower flange. Well, if you're going to push this girder off of its seat in order to get the flange to fail and bend upward so the girder falls, uh, these stiffeners are very important in preventing that from happening. So NIST left those off. We know that they were there because we, we've got construction uh, photographs that show them in place. The UAF study examined that question and said, well, what if we uh, allow the uh, girder to be pushed by the beams so that the web is past the corner of the uh, plate that supports it and put the stiffeners in there and see if the flange is going to fail and allow the girder to fail. And they found that with the stiffeners there, the flange was too robust. It wouldn't fail. NIST uh, admitted that they left the stiffeners off, but they said it's because uh, they didn't need to be included in their analysis. So we got to look at that for a second. There's some real... Uh, uh, shifty stuff going on here because if we look at the column, we see that the column had uh, uh, some uh, uh, some plates that were welded uh, to the uh, column, and those plates extended about 1.8 inches past the column flange. Those are side plates, two inches thick. When you heat up the beams and the girder, it butts up against the column, and it gets trapped behind the side plates. So that's another fact, shows that the girder couldn't have uh, fallen off. Now, NIST used two computer models, one local and one 16-story, to model their uh, analysis of why the building failed. And uh, when they showed their, six, their, their local model, they uh, showed that the beam, the girder, actually gets trapped behind the side plate. This is from the NIST report. So then uh, the web didn't buckle because the uh, girder was trapped and couldn't fall. So then they left that off of their general uh, model, the 16-story model, and they also left off the side plates and allowed the uh, beams to push the girder past the non-existent uh, stiffener plates and uh, allowed the beam to fall. So that was a very uh, tricky maneuver on their part, using their two models to claim that we didn't need the stiffener plates and we could get past the side plates by not including them in their general model. However, we'll go further and we'll uh, say, uh, let's, let's assume that NIST model works up to that point and the the uh, girder falls off at the 13th floor, it falls down and hits the 12th floor. Does it have enough force to cause the 12th floor to fail in turn and cause a cascade all the way down to the fifth floor? So we did a modal analysis of this uh, collapsing uh, corner of the floor. And uh, we determined that you're going to have to have a force of about 632,000 pounds hitting that uh, girder down here to break it loose. But when you analyze the force that's re that you actually get, it turns out to be only about one-tenth of that amount. So there can't be any cascade of force because you don't have nearly enough force from this falling girder to break the next floor loose. 
The 12th decision was to fabricate the buckling of column 79. So NIST says that, well, when all the floors collapsed down to the fifth floor, this column 79 was overloaded with the gravity load. It had no lateral support to prevent it from buckling. And so uh, it buckled and that's what initiated the collapse of the building. However, their own connection damage information and another part of the uh, report shows that there was no damage to the girders from the south and the west at the eighth floor, the ninth floor, and the 13th floor. So that means it had lateral support at those areas and the, the uh, column would not have been so slender and it wouldn't have buckled. So there's, there is sufficient lateral support and the column doesn't buckle. The 13th, 13th decision was to fabricate the collapse of the core column. So the uh, University of Alaska study said, okay, let's take out these columns and the next three columns as well. And let's see what happens. Let's see if that progresses from east to west as NIST says it was. And what they found was that the, uh, the columns in the southeast corner of the building here get overloaded when you take out these six core columns. They fail and the building tips over to the southeast. So this is what that looks like. So as you recall from the uh, photos, which we'll look again now, that collapse doesn't look anything like what really happened. Now we're going to look at what really happened in the videos, and we're going to compare it to the NIST model that they created with their computer model. So remember that their model began with a collapse down here on the 13th floor, uh, the buckling of column 79, and uh, then the total uh, collapse of the core columns and the building coming down. Compare it and see uh, what uh, their model looks like compared to the reality. Notice that although the building comes straight down into its own footprint, the NIST model uh, crumples up uh, once the uh, column 79 has collapsed, you get distortion of the exterior frame, uh, both upper and lower uh, on all sides, and it doesn't look anything like what the real uh, event looked like. So that's a problem. You have to have a model that mimics what really happened. This doesn't have that. And they stopped their model a couple of seconds into the, it doesn't go any further than this, because undoubtedly, uh, what it's going to show is a complete twisting and distortion of the frame. It's not going to look anything like what really happened. The next decision was to ignore the significance of free fall. So uh, in August of 2008, NIST uh, had a draft report briefing and a physics teacher showed up by the name of David Chandler. And he proved uh, with the, that the entire roof line of the building was in full free fall acceleration for about two and a half seconds which is far enough to fall eight stories near the beginning of its collapse. And NIST was forced to admit that finding in their final report, which they released in November of 2008. But they did not address the implications of free fall, and they did not change their model or conclusion to account for that effect. Free fall is important for this reason. Here we have a graph of the velocity of the roof uh, versus time. And it shows that uh, about three quarters of a second into, free, into the collapse, the building went into free fall for about two and a half seconds before it began to encounter some resistance and slow down uh, after that. So uh, the significance of free fall is uh, here we look at the building, 47 stories. At the start of the fall, uh, it goes into free fall, which means it fell about eight stories somewhere down here in the building. Uh, there was no resistance. So uh, all of the object's potential energy has to be converted to kinetic energy in free fall. It can't be doing any other work. It can't be destroying uh, the structure. So the free falling upper section of this building couldn't have been con 
crushing the lower portions, B and A, uh, because section B is not providing any resistance at all. But the NIST model never accelerates at free fall and can't explain this free fall episode in the collapse. The only way that could be explained is by the total removal of all this structure at once, as you would find in a controlled demolition. The last decision is the decision that they made to refuse to respond to legitimate inquiry. When they were asked by engineers to provide calculations and analysis results, substantiating the girder walk-off at column 79 and the impact force required to break through the next floor down, the NIST director refused, claiming it might jeopardize public safety. So here again, we come back to the conflict of interest between NIST having to defend the executive branch of the government and admit uh, the reality of what happened that day. When they were forced to make a choice, they chose to defend the executive branch of the government. So here's the categories of critical decision errors. We'll run through them quickly here. The failure of fires was a failure to follow procedures uh, on the part of the fire department and the falsification of records claiming that there was no water by NIST. Destruction of the evidence was a failure to follow the law regarding despoilation of evidence, and that included the uh, New York City Department of Design and Construction, the public, the police department, the mayor's office. Uh, the decision to appoint NIST to conduct the investigation, that's an ethics violation and a conflict of interest, and this director should have refused to do the study. Failure to test for incendiaries, failure to follow procedures, that's the, the fire department and NIST. Ignoring the presence of molten metal, that's the fire department and the Department of uh, Design and Construction. Ignore the effect of high temperatures on the steel, that's the, the again the uh, Department of Design and Construction, NIST and their contractors. Ignore the evidence of explosions in World Trade Center 7, that's a failure to follow procedures the uh, fire department, the police department, the FDI, FBI, the CIA, and NIST. Exaggerate the thermal load on the structure is ignoring the laws of physics. That's on NIST and their contractors. Falsify the thermal load on the structure. That's ignoring the laws of physics. That's on NIST and their contractors. Omitting critical structural features. That's ignoring the evidence on NIST and their contractors. Uh, fabricate the cascade of floor failures, that's ignoring the laws of physics on NIST and their contractors. Fabricate column 79 buckling, that's ignoring the laws of physics, NIST and their contractors. Fabricate the collapse of the core columns, same thing, physics, law of uh, physics, NIST and their contractors. Fabricate the collapse of the building, that's ignoring evidence, that's on NIST and their contractors. Ignore the significance of free fall, that's ignoring the laws of physics on NIST. And the refusal to uh, respond to legitimate inquiries, that's an ethics violation and conflict of interest uh, on the NIST director. So each of these critical decisions led the investigation toward the pre-examined conclusion that office fires caused the building collapse. The consistent pattern of those decisions made by key individuals operating within the large number of personnel involved in the investigation leads unavoidably, unavoidably to the inference that the decisions were deliberately guided by a coherent strategy to accomplish exactly that predetermined result. These key persons were affected, were affiliated with various agencies and organizations among which could have been FEMA, NIST, the mayor's office, the fire department, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the Structural Engineering Association of New York, uh, the Police Department, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, New York City uh, Design and uh, Design and uh, Department of Design and Construction, U.S. Congress, Department of Commerce, FBI, CIA, National Science Foundation, various contractors hired by NIST, and the corporate corporate news media. So going forward, identifying and interviewing those few persons who had the authority and made these 16 critical decisions is an important next step in the examination of the collapse of World Trade Center. 
And that is one of the tasks that we will be taking up. Okay, that's our conclusion. We would uh, like to uh, take on uh, any questions at this point. All right. Thank you, everybody, for participating in the chat out there on YouTube and also, again, for leaving your comments out on Facebook. That is where we take the questions from. Uh, we got a lot of good ones here. Uh, first one says, NIST said when the structure below and World Trade Center 7 finally failed, the top then came down in free fall. Did structure below in WTC1 fail first, then the top could come down essentially in free fall? No. The uh, destruction of the towers was a different matter. They did that differently. At, uh, in order to make it appear as if the top was crushing the lower part of the buildings, they started the uh, controlled demolition at or near the uh, location of the impact of the planes. So if you look at the towers coming down, uh, you'll see that the uh, it looks as if uh, upon first site that the top of the portion of the building above the impact zone is falling down onto the lower portion. And then the uh, co the controlled demolition aspect took part from the top down uh, uh, to mimic the uh, appearance that the top of the building was crushing the lower part of the building. So uh, the two mechanisms uh, uh, used in the towers were different than the uh, uh, method that they used in the uh, uh, in World Trade Center 7 because they they needed to make World Trade Center look as if the uh, failure occurred uh, low down in the building due to the fires. Okay, our next question asks, of the 47 floors of World Trade Center 7, how high up did Richard Rotans investigate? What floor was the elevator car blown out of the elevator shaft? Well, that is an excellent question, and we don't have the answer to that question at this point. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we want to talk to Mr. Rotans and other people that were in the building and uh, hear a, a clear explanation of why, wh where they saw the damage and uh, uh, how they could ascribe that to the collapse of World Trade Center 1, which had occurred earlier that morning. We don't think they're, based upon the description of the damage that they give that uh, it could have been attributed to the collapse of the towers. The towers didn't hit the building with severe uh, impact. Uh, and NIST acknowledged that. They have a, a debris map and they show uh, photographs and you see that most of the stuff that hit uh, building seven was uh, lighter stuff, uh, the exterior uh, cladding of the towers and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, so the next one is just more of a statement, but I'd like to get your thoughts on it. It says, the NIST model does not conform to observed reality. I know that's a big point for me uh, in, in talking about this. Can you comment on it, Roland? Yeah, I mean, the whole point of conducting a, 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 an analysis, a finite element analysis, is you should be able to come up with a model that matches uh, the observed uh, event. And... The University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, was able to do that only by removing the core columns and then uh, a second or so later taking out the perimeter columns over an eight story uh, continuous uh, uh, event low down in the building. That's the only way they could make their model look like the actual event. This never did get their model to look like the actual event. So for them to claim that they have an analysis that uh, explains the actual event is is frankly just ludicrous on the face of it their model doesn't match what happened exactly now this is another statement but it's a, a good one uh asymmetrical damage equals complete global failure of all supporting structure to the ground level can you comment on that yeah well i think that's the reason uh NIST never claimed that the damage uh, that was caused by the collapse of the north tower on world trade center 7 had anything to do with the collapse of world trade center 7 because they knew that was a no-no if 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 they were going to claim that the damage caused by building uh one collapsing uh was what caused world trade center so to collapse 
they would have had an anomaly to explain that nobody was going to buy because World Trade Center 7 was uh, not a symmetrical building. It was uh, trapezoidal in shape. And if you damaged uh, one side of it, uh, there was no way you were going to get a collapse that was straight down into its own footprint. So uh, they avoided that uh, uh, explanation altogether. They still tried to explain it with asymmetrical damage. In other words, the northeast corner of the building causing a, 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 a buckling of column uh, 79 is asymmetrical damage. And uh, that's why when you begin to look at their explanation, it just falls apart. Uh, and they can't get a model that matches uh, what really happened. And the University of Alaska study showed that if you tried to follow their reasoning, the building tips over and falls over to the side, which is what you would expect with asymmetrical damage. Very good. And I guess we will just close it up with this one. I thought this was cute. It says, it is off topic, but steel and angle. Mm, is this two cases of nominative, nom nominative determinism? And apparently that is the hypothesis that tend, that people tend to gravitate towards areas of work that fit their names. So I thought that was a cute observation there. So Roland, thank you so much uh, for doing this. Folks, don't forget, we're going to be back next week with the Twin Towers. Roland is going to be doing a presentation on that. And also, we're going to be back later this week with a, our anniversary event. It is called Forbidden Truth. Uh, we sent out the link to that in a bulletin earlier in the week. It is free of charge on YouTube and Facebook. You can watch that right here. You're going to see Roland. You're going to see our director of strategy, Ted Walter, and so many other uh, great experts uh, talking about various things. We're also going to have uh, clips of our film uh, that we're going to be releasing and a talk with Dylan Avery. And we're also going to be announcing a new project at the end. So tune into that Friday night. If you can't watch it Friday night, watch it on the archives. And... Uh, that is it. So any uh, final words, Roland? Thank you for tuning in. And remember, we need all of your support. Uh, this work uh, is tedious. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, we've been at it now for since 2006. And we need your continuing support. As you can see by this demonstration today, we are beginning to narrow our, our focus down to people that made critical decisions. And we think we're going to get some valuable information when we, when we begin to talk to them. So please continue to support us uh, in every way that you can. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks. See you on Friday.